Good evening, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And tonight is a special treat. We have uh, Robert Tagoni, his brand new book, In Her Tracks. And this is the virtual book launch on publication date. Uh, congratulations, Bob. It's great. Thank great you very to have much. You here. We'd love to great have to you be here. The store, but uh, and we do have a number of signed copies left. I'll put the link in the uh, comments field for those of you watching. And, uh, and also Luann Rice, uh, who has a brand new, relatively new book uh, called The Shadow Box, uh, is going to be hosting the, the uh, program this evening. And we still have a number of autographed copies of her book as well. So I'll put Andrew, that before you stop, hold the book up and take the cover off it. Oh, that's right. This is pretty cool. It has the most beautiful, look at that. The yeah. art on this book without the dust jacket is absolutely gorgeous. Those are shadow boxes. That wow. is such a nice thing that your publisher does for you, Luann. I'm so lucky. I, I love that. Also, Bob's publisher. So I, know, I mentioned Bob and I both have have them. <laughs> you should, you know, you should have like a police shield in Bob in Boston <laughs> or something here, see how it all goes. Yeah, so everybody watching, um, I'll be, as usual, kind of monitoring the Facebook comments. So if you have questions for uh, Robert Dugoni, Luann Rice, or Barbara, who's in New York right now, um, just put them in the comments field, and I'll, I'll materialize towards the end of the program and be happy to ask your questions. So anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you, Barbara, and you, Luann. Thank you, Patrick. So this is my first attempt to do anything on my iPad and I feel like it could blow up at any minute. So if I vanish from this evening, it's going, <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid to even mute myself for fear I'll blow up my iPad. So if I disappear, it won't be because I don't love Bob and Luann, it'll be because I'm a techno idiot and they will carry on. Um, in any case, Bob, it's wonderful to see you back with Tracy. Um, this is what, the eighth Tracy Crossway? Yeah, I think. And I'm, two I'm short getting, stories. I just counted. So yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm getting I'm a little, right. little mixed up because I'm I'm way ahead uh, as, as we were talking about. But it, it, I think that's the eighth book. Yes, I do. So Bob has just told us that during the pandemic, he's written five new books. So, um, you know, it's really good news for all of us who are Bob fans because he's been extra productive. <laughs> Luann, do I dare ask you if you've written anything extra? No, I wouldn't say extra, but I want to hear more from Bob about the five new ones. That's exciting. <laughs> Wonderful. All righty. So I'm going to say that Tracy, this is a really wonderful book because Tracy changes direction. She comes back from childbirth and other trauma and so forth, and she runs into her nemesis at the Seattle PD who has assigned her a different job. And all the way through the book, um, you have to wonder whether what's going to what's going to be the course of Tracy's police career. And and Bob answers it at the end, but we're not going to tell you because that would be a horrible spoiler. But anyway, Bob, why don't you um, kick off by telling us why Tracy's in this position, and then Luann will undoubtedly have brilliant questions to ask you, and I'll just sit here and hope I don't blow up. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, as always, thank you very much, and it is always an honor and privilege to do my book launch at Poison Pen, I wish I was doing it in person and uh, we could see each other and I could see all uh, the people in Scottsdale who are always so loyal and wonderful to come out and, and to hear me speak. Uh, hopefully we're gonna be doing that the next launch, Barb. Uh, fingers crossed, we'll, we'll get to do that. Um, so, you know, Tracy is, uh, she's a person that has uh, deep skeletal wounds. Um, she lost a sister when she was 18 years of age. She feels tremendous guilt about, about that. And um, she has a real soft spot for uh, victims of crime, especially young women. And uh, so she was in um, Cedar Grove. She went back to Cedar Grove after she had uh, her daughter, Daniela. And she was with her husband, Dan O'Leary. And uh, while she was back there, she really can't escape police work. She gets uh, drug into a uh, very complicated uh, police procedural back there uh, while she's trying to be a mom and, and, and while she's trying to get through, you know, get over the hurdle of, of being a mom and, and, and all that. She gets over it, but she suffers um, really a traumatic experience in Cedar Grove, which causes her to have some PTSD, which is not uncommon in uh, a lot of police officers who go through some real trauma. 
And so she's away from her office for longer than, than uh, she expected to be. And when she gets back, her boss, uh, her captain, Johnny Nolasco, uh, to keep the, the team running, has brought in two new detectives and uh, she doesn't have a spot, but he's very crafty, he's very smart. And what he does is he gives her a, uh, a position on cold cases. In fact, she's the only detective on cold cases She's taking over for a guy that's retiring. And in, in Seattle, there is one cold case detective. Um, so um, she, uh, she is really debating whether she wants to take this position because she feels like she's being forced into it by her, um, by her boss. And she doesn't like to be manipulated. But she decides to give it a try. And she's immediately drawn to the case of a five-year-old young girl who who disappears in a corn maze uh, five years pr prior to Tracy taking this position. She just vanishes. And she's the daughter of a Seattle police officer named Bobby Chin. And in the midst of this investigation, her old partner, Kensington Rowe, comes in and says, I need some help. And he pulls her into the case of a missing 18-year-old jogger who goes from, for a jog in a park in Washington state and vanishes. So it's really, uh, there's really multiple cases going on at the same time. Um, I like to challenge myself with every new book. Uh, so in this book, I really wanted to have multiple cases that Tracy was um, attempting to solve. And it really, it's, it's more, more like real police work. You know, police don't, officers don't have just one case. They have multiple cases. So that was my, that was my challenge in, in this book, was to uh, have two separate cases that Tracy is going through and and, and, um, and, and be able to solve them both. Uh, in the book I've just written, uh, my challenge was to have every single scene in Tracy's point of view. So a 415 page uh, novel, all in Tracy's point of view, no, no other third parties. And I'm really pleased with how that came out as well. So, you know, I think we writers do this all the time, um, you know, come up with these, these ways to, to challenge ourselves and new ways of telling stories. And, and I hope, I hope people like this. The initial reviews have been, been wonderful. And I looked just a, a little while ago and the book was all the way up to like number 12 on, on um, Amazon's bestseller list. So fingers crossed things are going well. Well, congratulations on pub date, Bob. Thank and you. Yeah, I'm so I'm honored to be with you tonight and also thank you to Barb for inviting me to be the one to get to spend this lovely time with you. Um, I loved, I love the book. I, I was lucky enough to read it in Bound Galleys and, uh, you know, it's so many, it's so, it's so multi-layered and, you know, I love the way that you wrote about, as you mentioned, several cases unfolding, you know, at the same time and how they kind of affect each other, not necessarily, um, you know, uh, not necessarily that they're linked precisely, but that they're connected to Tracy and that she is the character who connects them all. And one of the things that I thought was so touching and impressive was the way you wrote about PTSD for Tracy and how her experience with her sister, what, what she went through as a younger woman and um, how that's affected her personally and also as a detective. And it's partly, I think, what makes this book so really, you know, compelling and um, page turning, but also full of heart, like really uh, care, you know, made me care so much about her as I always do, but in particular with this one, you know, given um, also the echoes of the child. Uh, so how did, did you, you know, did you do a lot of research on PTSD or is that just something that you, um, felt that you knew that with Tracy? Um, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with PTSD on a, on a lot of different levels, none personally, thank God. Uh, uh, but, you know, um, I can remember years ago when our son was born and um, my wife stayed home. Uh, we weren't at the, at the point in the business community yet where you had paternity leave like they do now. Um, and so we, my wife stayed home and, uh, you know, I forget how long she was home for, but it was, you know, a good six months or whatever. And then she was getting ready to go back to work. And we had this absolutely fabulous nanny, an Irish nanny named Therese. 
uh, who becomes the nanny for Daniela in, uh, in, in my Tracy Crossride series. And she was wonderful. This woman was absolutely wonderful. And yet when we got in the car to drive to work that, what, that morning, my wife just burst into tears. Uh, and my wife is a, is a, she's a, she's a dedicated businesswoman. She's always been um, uh, a professional and she's always worked, but this was a really difficult moment in her life. And I always will remember that. Um, and I know it from my, from my perspective of watching my sisters go through it. I think it's a very difficult thing uh, that women go through more than men. Um, and, and it's that, it's that, that tug, that tug and pull between, you know, doing what you're very competent at doing and feeling, you know, that, that, that you want to continue to do that. And yet at the other side, you have that feeling of, I want to just stay home and take care of my baby. And somehow that's not considered to be as important or as difficult. And we all know those of us who have kids, we know it's difficult. It's extremely difficult. So I was, I really wanted to sort of wrestle with with that problem. I wanted Tracy to wrestle with that problem. Um, but at the same time, it's a, it's a mystery and it's a police procedural. And so you, you know, I had to be careful. I had to balance. I, I couldn't have too much. I had to pull back in fact on some of it because it was important that the story gets going and the story gets moving. Um, people pick up books uh, like, like my books um, because they're fast paced. They're quick, you know, they're quick and they go and, and they're into the story immediately. They're into the case immediately and off we go. So I had to sort of balance that. And I balanced it by just trying to make he Tracy very human. And she's dealing with it while she's moving forward uh, to solve these two cases. That's fascinating because it is very fast paced, you know, from the minute, I mean, and the way that you structure it, you know, with the prologue and how that starts with another case and then moves into the Tracy case. Um, but I think that you just made her such a full real character. And to me, that's how a story, uh, how the pace of the story works the best is when the character feels so real and you're compelled to real because, read because you are feeling it from her perspective and you know, in her intelligence. And uh, you write women really well, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> really you know, I have, to, I have to say this one thing. Um, when I was trying to think of, of what I was going to write next, uh, I was talking with my son, who's 24, and um, he's very intuitive about a lot of things. Uh, and he said, you know what you ought to write about? And I said, what's that? And he said, you ought to write about a child gets lost in a corn maze. Oh, wow. And I said, where, where is this coming from? And he said, it's just, isn't it just incredibly frightening? And what he was recalling was he was recalling a moment when my wife went into a department store and had my son. And he was at this point, he was, you know, four or five, old enough to walk and all those things. And she had him right beside her and she turned her head and she turned back and he was gone. Oh my God. And there's that, that horrible moment where you just, you feel like everything's been taken from you. It's, it, everything's gone. Uh, and my, my wife actually ran to the front of this department store and yelled at the clerks to lock the doors wow. and not let anyone leave. Well, it turned out that he was hiding underneath one of the clothes racks. <laughs> and, you know, I, so when I wrote that, when I wrote that prologue, I've already received so many emails from people in the midst of reading the book who said, who have shared their experience with me about that, that terrifying moment when your child suddenly is out of sight mm -hmm. and, and your, your immediate reaction is they've been taken. Um, and so I really wanted to sort of capture that. And I wanted to capture the realities of a divorced father who was in the middle of a horrible divorce um, where the wife is being very manipulative. And, and of course the child is going to start to play the parents off of one another. And, and he's just trying to be a good dad, you know, and, and he makes this horrific mistake. And by just because he loves his daughter and he wants her to be happy. And I think we, I think we all can sort of relate to that on, on one, one level or another. Oh, I think totally. I mean, first of all, yes, as, as I was reading that, I had a moment of panic, you know, a missing child, no matter where it is, it's like, have you will ever see that, that little baby again, you know, and that came through very clearly. I won't say anything. I don't want to give anything away, but um, 
but that, you know, I think that the way that you write about, you know, emotions and about family um, is what probably draws me in the most that you capture the feeling of, you know, really loving, you know, other people, loving, a, you know, a, a family, and then just the sort of the nightmares that can go wrong within that, you know, within that framework and within sort of the place that you should feel the safest, you know, and where you expect to have the most security. And I think that that's what makes your, one of the reasons that your books are so compelling is that they're, you, you know, you're in this sort of environment where you know everybody and you feel like everything's going to be okay. And then it, when it falls apart, it's all the more devastating. You know, and I really did feel that with Bobby Chin and with, um, you know, his his family, but, you know, also with Tracy and the, her background and the way that that came into play. And it's so it's so fascinating that this is your eighth Tracy novel. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, have has she changed for you a lot? I mean, obviously she has, but um, do you find that she grows along with you as a writer, or that she, you know, she kind of stays sort of essentially the same as when yeah, you- I'm, I'm in that, uh, I'm in that weird, um, I'm in that weird position where, you know, Tracy, Tracy is a little bit older when I introduce her to readers. I, you know, she's in her, in her forties uh, when I introduce her to readers. And, um, you know, I have to be careful because if I write stories in sort of real time, I mean, Tracy's going to be an 80 year old detective, you know, at some point. And so uh, what I what I really am doing, what I really enjoy is I am picking up from immediately from the prior case. So even though a year or a year and a half or two years in real time has passed in in Tracy time, in book time, it's only been a few months mm -hmm. and now she's on to the next case. And, you know, um, there hasn't been really any advantages to COVID. So I say that uh, up front. But one thing that I have done that I, I never really did before is I, I have watched um, uh, series, television series, and a, a number of them. And um, I watched, for instance, um, Pennyworth, the British series, uh, Alfred Pennyworth. And I've learned a lot watching that series from, from you know, watching what the writers do, how they immediately pick up the next episode from the ending of the prior episode. And also they never kill their antagonists. Their antagonists never die. They kill a lot of protagonists, uh, you know, and it's sort of got an Alfred Hitchcock uh, thing to it. Um, and so I, what, I'm, what I'm learning with Tracy is, um, you know, she's gone from a, from a, a really a, a, a person that had um, a tremendous amount stuffed into her closet that uh, she just couldn't, she couldn't shake on her own. And so she was very guarded and she's very protected. And so with Dan, she's becoming um, more and more open. She's, um, she's starting to, um, to be able to see the world a, a little bit more broadly than she was seeing it. You know, before she saw it in terms of black and white, uh, in terms of right and wrong, um, she was very uh, distrustful of people and their motives. And through Dan, she's starting to see sort of a broader horizon that, you know, not everybody out there maybe is, is bad. Um, at the same time, because of what she's gone through, she's very guarded about her daughter. And, and so there are always those moments in, in her life where you know, she's thinking about what's going to happen with my daughter when she turns 13 or 14 or 15. And, you know, those are, again, those I think are universal concerns. You know, my daughter is now 21 years old and, um, you know, she, uh, she went to Cabo uh, for spring break and, it, you know, it wasn't with my blessing uh, under all the circumstances, but, you know, she's an adult. She paid for it herself. And all you can do is hope that you have taught them, you know, to, to do, you know, not to do stupid things, you know. Um, but it, it's, you know, when she got back onto American soil, <laughs> I was very relieved, you know. And and I think I think every parent goes through that. I I, I remember my mother telling me, you know, you never stop being a parent, mm -hmm. and I think that's going to be what's going to be Tracy's next challenge. 
Wow, that's a lot to think about. Um, first of all, yeah, I love the way that Dan is is softening her and sort of making her trust more, but almost against her will, but in a way that's really uh, very touching. And I can feel it, you know, I, I, as I do often when I read about your characters, but that's such an interesting story about your daughter. And it just kind of reminds me of being around that age. And I went off on a whale, a whale research trip um, from Woods Hole, Massachusetts down to the Caribbean to study humpback whales on, a, on an oceanographic re research vessel. And I had to fly to uh, St. Thomas and my father, I, I remember like I was really excited and I was, like I was 19, I guess. And I, I had it all planned out. I was gonna stay in this like cheap hotel when I first got down there and he like put me up in, you know, the Sheraton or something like that. And, <laughs> and it was like, I was, you know, exactly as if he was right there, you know, very protective and, um, that, you know, but you, you don't think about that when you're that age, you think about it when you're our age, but um, that, they'll be in the next book possibly, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt and, and give you a story that will illustrate that this phenomenon of losing children is not restricted to young children. Um, a few years ago, my almost 50 year old daughter and myself, we took a cruise across the North Atlantic from Rotterdam back to Boston. and. Uh, she's a photographer, and so one of her, her real goal on this trip was to photograph puffins. And oh. for some reason, as we're going along, puffins are in very short supply. But when we get to Iceland, there's an island called Heme that is on the south part of Iceland. It's it Reykjavik's over on the west, so you're on your way to it. And there's a fairly narrow entry to get into Heme, and the weather was terrible, and the captain, this big ship, didn't think he could take his ship into this. It was gonna to be too dangerous, but after much negotiation with his home office, he sails in and we spend the night and word comes that there really are puffins somewhere on Heme. And so my daughter's all excited. And the next day, the captain starts getting nervous and you, you know, it looks as though he's gonna sail away. Never are we going to get off and see puffins, but we had signed up to get off the ship. So I said, you know, Let's do it because he can't leave us. If we're off, you know, on the island, he's going to have to. Just, so anyway, off we go. And we're with a group in a little bus and the weather is just appalling. It is sheeting rain and we stream around and we finally get somewhere near the coast and we all get out of the bus and we go through the rain and there's a hide, you know, it's a little hut that you can go to that has glass where you can see out of and see the birds and so forth. And so we all have our heads down, it's pouring rain, we slickers on and all, and we get into the hut and she's gone. There is no sign of her. And I think, what happened? And somebody said, we saw her going over the cliff. And I thought, how am I ever gonna explain this to her husband and her father that I have lost her in Iceland, you know, she's just vanished on me. And it turned out that she did indeed go over the cliff because she saw puffins and she climbed <laughs> down and she took these amazing photographs, one of which won an award. And eventually, just as my heart has completely stopped, she reappears over the cliff. And I thought, this was like those horrible stories where you've left your child in the bathtub to answer the phone okay. and you, you know, you forgot. And it was exactly that feeling. And I am in, you know, I'm nearly 70 and she's 50. So it doesn't happen just... It never goes away. It, it, yeah. it isn't about little kids all the time. It can be about big kids. Yeah. It was awful. I still, remember, I still have PTSD from that. Every once in a while, I wake up and I think, what would I have done if she hadn't reappeared? That's yeah. horrific. Oh, my God. I, I do want to see the award-winning photo, though. I'll show it to you. Um, it's really fabulous. I have a, a picture of it at home. I'll photograph it and send it to you. But, I mean, it was... For her, it was all worth it. For me, I will probably never fully recover from the trauma. Um, so I can, I mean, that my point is that no matter how old you are, your children are still your children, no matter how old they are. And you never really get over that custodial feeling, you know, um, even if they are full-fledged adults and you can't alter their choices, you can't tell them, Bob, not to go, right? Yeah, no, I mean. Uh, anyway, it fit right up. in with what we're talking about, so. I thought you might be interested in knowing that it just is a forever thing. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. That's a that's actually a great, that's a great novel too. Your adult, your adult child goes around the corner and you don't see her again. Disappears. Yeah. Well, I, I give it to you as a plot. Either one of you feel free to write it. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. So Luann, carry on. What other questions did you have? I didn't mean to interrupt oh. your flow. Oh, no, no, not at all. No, just, um, I am, you know, so, well, I'd, so I'd like to know how, oops, sorry, you can probably hear a little scuffling. Those are cats. Um, it's nighttime here. It's nine o'clock on the East Coast. Oh, it's actually 930. And that's their playtime. So when I've done this with you before, Barbara, it's been earlier in the day, but somehow they get going around this time of night. So actually, if you look very carefully at you, there's a black shape that keeps going up and down the stairs behind. It's really yeah. sinister looking. <laughs> it's four of them that are kind of going back and forth. Um, and they're definitely tormenting us because they know I don't want to have to pay attention to them. So they right now are they have a pen that they're batting about on the floor. But, um, and of course it's a pen, right? They're torturing us. But, um, so, but Bob, you have other series, not just the Tracy series. That is, uh, how, I mean, I've never done anything like that. Like, it's really interesting to me how, how do you um, keep them going and keep them separate and sort of, I mean, I don't know how your writing works, but for me, like with fiction, uh, at any given time, I feel like li life happens in, in life, you sort of think like a novelist, right? Like events occur or you read articles or you're dreaming and something comes into your mind and that's somehow connected with what you're writing. But if you have more than one series going, how does that work? Yeah. You know, I, I just, I always have ideas and I, there's always something kind of going through my mind uh, and sometimes it just comes about sort of fortuitously. Uh, the Charles Jenkins series came about as a result of a conversation that I had with a, a man about um, about a trial that he had been involved in and uh, for espionage mm -hmm. and you know it, it, it just I could just I could see the story in my head I could see it developing and then it was my editor uh, Gracie Doyle who said hey you know have you thought about making Charles Jenkins a, a series or at least having a trilogy of, of books. And, and I, she and I talked about how we could, we could do that. And um, so, you know, I had those three books. Am I gonna continue the Charles Jenkins series? I'd like to, um, I don't have anything sitting at the top of my head. Uh, there are some ideas that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Obviously China is a hotbed right now um, and I've been to China. And so there's some things there that are possibility. Um, Barb knows that I'm, I'm heading to Egypt uh, next November and that could be rich with potential book ideas and, and stories. But, um, you know, I, 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 I'm no longer writing the David Sloan series, be, legal thrillers because of, you know, a whole host of things. But um, recently, Gracie and I talked about his son, Jake, who's now become a lawyer hmm. and the possibility of, of doing a legal thriller uh, with Jake. And so that is kind of stirring in the back of my mind. And then, you know, uh, on top of all that, um, I really grew up reading, I, 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 grew, I didn't grow up reading series books or genre books. I grew up reading classics. My mother was uh, an English teacher before she started having 10 children. And uh, she used to hand me books all the time. And I didn't realize at the time what she was handing me, but she was handing me The Count of Monte Cristo, Cristo The Old Man and the Sea, of Mice and Men, um, The Great Gatsby, uh, The Red Badge of Courage. Uh, and then when I got a little bit older, the books that I would gravitate to would be A Prayer for Owen Meany and The World According to Garp, uh, uh, South of Broad, um, you know, all those sort of, you know, life lived, I'd like to call them, uh, stories. And, and so, you know, I, something will just hit me, the extraordinary life of Sam Hell, the, the story of this young boy growing up in this bucolic setting uh, with, with, a, with a, um, a, a, a handicap, you know, he has red eyes. And, and it'll hit me and it just, it just becomes very vivid to me. Um, you know, I didn't know when I'd write another literary novel, but then, you know, I had this, this wonderful idea, this coming of age story for uh, a young man who graduates from high school and he starts working on a construction crew before college with two men who uh, have returned from from Vietnam and one has PTSD and you know that was an experience that I went through when I was 18 years of age and so that becomes very vivid to me and you know I kind of write what is vivid to me at that at that moment um, because the characters become very real to me uh, people ask me that all the time. And, 
you know, when I started out in this business, I, I'm the first one to say that I was not writing from my heart. I was writing from my head. And there was a moment in time when I had to let that go, um, where I had to have the courage to, to really be an artist. And I think to really be an artist, you have to expose yourself and put, put everything out there, whether it's on the pages or whether it's on a canvas, whatever it is. Um, and I was thinking of this, this story, this book, and I actually went to Barb Peters and we sat in her backyard and we talked about Tracy Crosswhite and what I could do with her and bringing her back. And, you know, it, it, you have, there's, there's, you have, there's some courage that you have to have there. And, and that courage is to, to, you know, to, to lay it all out there and understand that some people are going to step on it. You know, you're going to put your heart out on a page and some people just can't wait to trample it. But I think most people appreciate the fact when they're reading a story and the story is alive for them. And, you know, the stories really become alive for me because the characters become alive for me. And I really just try to let those characters sort of percolate and, 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 and go. Um, I don't know what I'm going to write next. Uh, you know, it's the first time I, I, I've kind of fulfilled all my obligations in terms of my stories at the moment. Um, what I'm going to write next, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, whether I'm going to write the next Tracy book or whether I'll do another Charles Jenkins books or do something different like Jake Sloan. Um, I'm going to have to kind of just, just see what begins to come to me. Well, I, I love the way that you're, you, that you talk about writing from your heart and writing from your head. And it feels very, your books are very smart, but they very much feel as if they're from the heart. I, 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 I think they all do to me, but um, particularly this one in her tracks. Um, and how lucky we both are to have Barb in our lives and to have her support um, as a wonderful book lover and bookseller and good friend for so many years. And, you know, and that she's actually inspired you in that way and that you were able to have that conversation. And, you know, I, I feel very lucky myself um, to, to have her in my life too and to have, you know, just, you know, as a, we're writers and we're, we're very much at our desks, you know, us and the characters and then to have other people in our lives. You've mentioned Gracie and I, Bob, you and I are very uh, lucky. We have some sub publishing people in common aside from Barb, but we have um, Tom Mercer, we have Gracie and uh, we have the same agency, literary agency, Meg and Andrea, the Jane Rutgerson agency. And uh, I know. Um, and, <laughs> it's so cute. I love it. You know, we should we should tell people because not everybody may know this that Bob was an attorney, um, and so you know it's almost a left brain right brain thing here going on. Um, when I first met Bob with his very first book, we've been together for his entire career. Um, I think I think when he said he was writing from his head, and in part that comes because you know you were still practicing law. I mean, you had to you know make a living and publishing your first novel is a purely speculative venture most of the time. Um, and then you, you had a brave moment when you realized that if you really want to succeed as a writer, you were going to have to give up your other job and you were really going to have to write. You had great support from your wife, who was fabulous in there. But I think, didn't you think that's when that shift came when you decided to write from your heart if you were going to go all in and try to try to be a successful novelist? Yeah, no, I... I I very much think so. It's, it, as I said, it, it's a scary moment because, I mean, I remember, I remember writing that book. I remember how vulnerable Tracy was. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that vulnerability comes from my own vulnerabilities. Um, I mean, one of the things you learn when you get older, uh, and I just turned 60, uh, is you learn right. <laughs> everybody has something, right? E everybody's dealing with something but people don't like to talk about it. And when you're an author, your characters have to be so transparent about all their, you know, their, their foibles, all, all the, all the things that, that they don't, they don't do right. All the, all the things in their life that, that, you know, aren't perfect. And um, I remember that. I remember as I wrote that book, I remember thinking how, how vulnerable Tracy is. And, and I, I heard Diana Gabaldon talk about it years ago at a conference up in Surrey, British Columbia. 
And she talked about uh, the magic. And she said that she goes into her room and she closes the door and she lights a candle and she waits until her characters feel comfortable enough to speak to her. And whatever they say first, she just starts typing. And she trusts that they will tell her a story. And, um, you know, that's, that's a, a very scary, vulnerable moment to, to go in and sit at a typewriter and say, I don't know what I'm going to write about, but I know there's a story out there and it will come to me. And, and then you have to put it on the page raw and unfiltered so that the readers can, can receive it in the way that it was intended to be told. And um, it is, it, it's scary. And, and as, as a lawyer, you do almost the opposite. You know, you write, you, you, you write only what you want people to read in a way only that you want people to interpret it because you're trying to persuade them of something. You're not trying to, to just paint pictures for them. You're trying, to, you're trying to tell them what to do and what to think. And I think early on in my career, I was trying to tell readers what to think. And I had that moment where I decided that's not my job. My job is to give them the story and let them think whatever it is that they think. That's amazing. That, I mean, I spoke to you the, yesterday, even I spoke privately, Bob, and I was really fascinated with how, you know, how your legal career has affected your writing. And we didn't talk about this in particular, but that's such an interesting way of thinking about legal work and legal writing as opposed to fiction. And um, I love that, that you let the characters emerge and uh, it's the opposite of control, really. Yeah, I mean, people will say to me, um, do, you know, do you know what's gonna happen? Do you know the endings of your books? And I don't, I really, I, I, this book in particular, I, I really did not know the ending. And I remember when it came to me mm -hmm. and I went, oh my God, oh my God. And then I had to literally stop and go back and think my way through the book and think, can I do this? Because you want your ending to be inevitable, but unexpected. You, and, you, and so, nailed it. you totally nailed it. The ending in this book is so brilliant and so unexpected, yet so inevitable, you know, as, as and exactly what you're saying, like it, it added up perfectly, but you couldn't add it up as you were going along. You had to get to the end and go, wait, really? And then, oh yeah, of course. It was so satisfying and wonderful. Um, well, you know, I'm a big, I, I love the movie, The Sixth Sense. Um, and, and the reason I loved it is, is because I didn't figure it out. You know, I, I got to the end of that movie and suddenly it was like, how many times did that kid say, I see dead people? I mean, it was, it was inevitable, but unexpected. And, and, and I've all, so when those endings come to me in that, in that way, and I say, oh my Lord, and I go back and I say, does this, does this fit? I mean, is it inevitable? And then when I find out that I've been writing that, that path all the way through the book, I just didn't know it. And, you know, people don't, People don't fully understand that when I say that because they always think that I, that I outline or that, but I, I really don't. It's, it's almost as if I'm hearing the story for the first time also, and I'm just transcribing it. I'm with you completely on that. And I'm the same way. I never know how the book is going to turn out at all. I have no clue how it's going to end. But it's so interesting because when we were speaking yesterday, we were talking about um, the unconscious and how sometimes our novels can be predictive. And you said it in a really kind of funny way. Like I was telling you sort of a, a terrible thing, which is that my life has been touched by murder in several, at several times in my life where uh, somebody I knew and loved was murdered and somebody else I loved was an alibi witness in a murder case. And there were, there's just been some really personal things. And you said, how did you put it? It was so, it was so kind of chilling when you said something like, are you afraid that you know, oh, because, remember? Yeah, um, I, I said that that life, life and art really do imitate one another. Right. And, and, and it can be a really scary moment when you start to realize that the stories you're writing are coming true. Right. And I think what you're saying too about like, at least what I'm feeling about what you're saying about getting to the end of your novel 
writing your novel and having the ending be inevitable but surprising to you is that somehow deep down inside, you know, the, the deepest part of the writer in you somehow must have known it like some unconscious way but that you're you're not it and I think that's what the genius of your books are is that you you know somehow you know it but you don't let yourself know it because you're not manipulating the story or mani manipulating the characters like you're really letting it unfold as in a real life you know crime and thriller way and then all of a sudden it's not all of a sudden like you've decided this is going to be the ending it's that that is the ine inevitable ending but that it, even you didn't know it except you did somewhere <laughs> yeah I, you know i i remember when diana said said that and stephen king said something very similar stephen king calls it telepathy mm -hmm. you know he says how does a writer sitting at her desk in in a uh, how does how does she write a story that affects the emotions of someone in a town that the writers never visited and never will visit um and and yet their story has has such deep personal meaning to that reader and and he, he calls it telepathy and and i think that's sort of what what i meant when we talked about sort of those universal truths and i i think that i think that there's there are stories out there that um you know that they just they exist and writer a writer just has to find that place whatever it is you know diana has found it stephen king has found it uh, i feel like i'm starting to find it where you feel comfortable enough and and um you have enough um confidence to say okay i don't know what this story is yet but i'm willing i'm willing to listen you know, I'm having kind of a what might be a cheap insight here. I hope it's not, but thinking about it, because I mean, I've known you when you were a lawyer and all the rest of it. You're, you know, to be a good lawyer, you have to be an advocate. You really do. You have to be an advocate for your client. You have to, as you say, you have to shape the story um, in order to, you have to advocate for your client by shaping a story that gets you to the result that you're looking for. And it's occurring to me that you are being an advocate for your characters. You haven't really changed, you know, you simply adopted that role for imaginary people, but you know, they're real to you. And therefore it's really not that different. Um, I might, that, that might be tortuous, but I sort of think it's true, particularly in your case. You know, the legal training really does leave a mark. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I've spoken to, as you know, hundreds of writers, some of whom are lawyers and some of whom are not. Um, but I think in general, the lawyers have that same, that same quality because, you know, they've been trained to, to shape stories. They've been trained to advocate. And so it's not really that different if, you, if you're putting them in a book and working it out. And you don't know. I mean, look at the, how we were all waiting today for the verdict. And, you know, I'm here in New York and I will tell you that there's a beautiful park across the street. And um, the, peach, the cherry blossoms are out and the daffodils are up and the tulips, none of which do I ever see in Phoenix, right? So I really wanted to go out for a late afternoon walk. And then I thought to myself, you know what? I just got a bulletin from the Scottsdale Police Department telling us what to do in case there was rioting because, you know, we had a, a riot. And I thought, I think I'm just going to stay here until yeah. the verdict is announced because in New York, it will be much worse than it will be in Scottsdale yeah. if there is unhappiness the verdict and I thought okay you know we had two sides that that advocated and you know we had a jury that had to decide which was the more compelling choice and no matter you know this I know this from trials no matter what the evidence is in the end juries decide on the basis of the best story they hardly ever render a verdict based purely on on evidence and um I thought it was a you know it's a very interesting afternoon to um, to think that through and think about the consequences uh, on a national basis not just for Minneapolis yeah and I, I you know I think I, I think that that um, there are no there's no better stories out there than than real life I mean it, you know it, 
you can write a true story and, and people just can't believe it. They can't believe that it's true. Especially over the yeah. last several years. Yes, absolutely yeah. true. <laughs> so yeah, before mean, we call Patrick up, Bob, let's ask Luann too, because not everybody was present when Luann and I um, did a wonderful talk about the shadow box. Luann, can you just go back and do a little pre-see about the shadow box, which I think is an absolutely wonderful book. Oh, um, thank you so much. Um, well, the sh and the shadow box is uh, my second thriller for Thomas Mercer, and it brings back uh, the detective Connor Reed and his brother, Co um, Coast Guard Commander Thomas Reed. Uh, and it's about a, an, a woman who is attacked and left for dead in the garage of her very posh house on the Connecticut shoreline. And it may or may not have been her husband who attacked her. And she has to manage to stay alive while also trying to figure out who did this to her. Um, and the shadow box title comes from the type of work she does. She's an artist and she creates shadow boxes, which are um, kind of uh, frames that contain objects that are meaningful to her. And in her case, from the beach and the woods. And so she's really hiding um, in the wilderness uh, while she's uh, trying to survive. It's a you know, I, 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 I blurbed your last book and, and I'm reading this book and I'm almost done. And I said, I said it then and I'll say it again is I don't know that anyone does better that thin line between love and hate. Oh, wow. Thank you. And um, it's a really compelling book because it's so real. It's so believable. And, you know, we see this all the time. We see people that are madly in love with each other and then within a, a you know a moment suddenly you know they they hate each other uh they're ready the to kill each other is ripped off you know yeah, yeah it's uh it's really compelling uh it's psychologically um it's psychologically disturbing and it's it's a really compelling story thank you bob. i thought so too bob and um i was thinking about prince philip and you know his remark that a really long marriage survives on tolerance you know, no matter how you love people and so forth, if you can't be tolerant of each other, there's really no no path to um, to survival. Let me call Patrick up because he's been looking at Facebook, and um, I always like this moment when he reappears. Anyway, it's so magical. Hello, oh, Patrick. Hi. Hi there. Uh, yeah, you have some questions. Um, this one is from Andrea, who has a question for both of you, which is uh, how do you how do you do your police research? Do you have any sources there or how do you stay current? Um, so I have a lot of sources. Um, unfortunately, I lost a source uh, two years ago. Um, Detective Scott Tompkins passed away suddenly um, and, and really tragically um, of an illness. Uh, and it was really it was really heart wrenching. And um, his uh, his girlfriend at the time, his fiance, is really my Tracy Crosswhite. And um, she has she has always wanted to stay involved. Um, it's it's she enjoys it. It's fun, and she helps me get in touch with people that I need, like the forensic uh, medical examiners and the the, the trackers. Um, yeah, um, who else do I have? I mean, a, a, kind of a whole host of people that will help me out. I have another friend that was on a, a terrorism task force, and um, he's up north, and 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 he helps me out. Um, with the current Tracy book, I'm actually, um, I actually had to find an attorney that dealt with the RICO charges and, and ask him for his advice and help on, on some of my stuff. So I, I lean heavily on those individuals. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why I, I just, I, I don't buy the argument that, you know, all police officers are bad because I know so many of them who are really, really wonderful people. And I think it's like any profession out there, you can have a bad apple but that doesn't mean the whole orchard is spoiled. Yeah, same so way. In? I feel the same way. Um, my great, my grandfather was a uh, captain of detectives in Hartford. So, um, and I grew up kind of wanting to be a be an officer, you know, be a detective. Um, I have a really good friend named Rob Derry, who's on the Con um, Connecticut State Police. And uh, as I was telling Bob yesterday, I have a really, great source in the FBI who's somebody I can turn to when I need to um, have information about any kind of federal inf uh, investigation or uh, prosecution. But yeah, I feel very lucky to have good sources in the police. Um, let's see, uh, Mary has a question. She asks, um, 
curious as to if you have a regular daily routine when you write. And then I think this is for Bob, but it applies certainly to both of you. And she says, thanks for all the wonderful books and congratulations on this new one. Oh, well, thank, thank you. Um, you know, I do. Uh, one of the things that law taught me was how to put your butt in a chair and go to work. And, um, you know, I, I get up early and I get to my desk early and I will work from say, you know, seven till nine. And then I might take a break and do a Pilates class with my sister um, online. This is our, my, you know, part of my COVID exercise. And then I, I go right back to work at 10 o'clock and, and I'll work, you know, I'll work till, you know, I used to work till three, four, five, uh, five o'clock every day. Um, now I'll take some time off with the weather nice and I'll try to enjoy the afternoon and go out and play some golf or uh, with my wife or with friends or spend time. But, you know, I don't think there's any substitute for, for putting in the time. And I, and part of that, I mean, is when you put in the time, it helps you really get comfortable with your characters and your story so that you can carry through a plot for 400 pages. How about you, Luann? What's your routine like? Very similar. You know, I, I get up early and uh, my, I have sort of a talismanic need to get to my desk before I speak to anybody except the cats. Um, you know, I have, make coffee, go to my desk, write till I am sort of ready to take a break and then take a break and then come right back and continue for the rest of the day. But I like the way Bob put it. You know, it's discipline and I don't think of it that way, but it really is. It turns out to be discipline. Are the cats in there in your inner sanctum? right now oh they are I, if anybody goes on my social media you'll see <laughs> pictures of the ocean and my cats usually they're in baskets right on my desk here's <laughs> one this is one right here this is emelina she's <laughs> always sitting with me <laughs> all right let's see um yeah i have a few more um let's see this is more of a comment jacqueline says uh, i love the fact uh bob that each of your books is a standalone Yet for those of us who are Tracy fans, we see her life change in each book. Let's see, Mary Lee says, are any of your characters in the stories based on people you know? Um, you know, I think, the, I think the honest answer for any writer is every character in every book is based upon somebody that we know. Um, I, 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 I teach a, a, a writing seminar called the Novel Writing Intensive and I, and I tell my students, you know, you have to get over the fact that people think, oh my God, that character is you. Um, because characters are of us and they, they can't be of anybody else. So I think every character has is either an amalgamation of the people that I've known in my life, intimately, the people I've, I've known in my life, you know, on the periphery, uh, the things I've read, the movies I've watched, the, the you know, the the books I've read, I mean, all those things come into play, I think, in creating characters. So every character in every book is invariably somebody that I know or knew and and they're, they're, they're fodder. Um, let's see, Bonnie asks, she says, would love to see Tracy in a series, uh, perhaps on Netflix, any chance of that? We're hoping, um, I've had a few, um, I've had a few deals uh, the Charles Jenkins deal was was uh, done a little while ago, and uh, the extraordinary life of Sam Hell is is currently being uh, shopped by a, a woman in Los Angeles. Um, Tracy's, a, a, I, I think Tracy would be a, a, a wonderful series, um, and, and we've had we've had feelers, and we had we had one option, but the option expired. So um, I'm hoping, you know, fingers crossed. I think I think it would be would be great. Let's see. Okay, Andrea asks, she says, uh, Bob, do you have a vision of where, for where Tracy's life will be five or 10 years from now? Do you write towards that or does the character surprise you and develop along the way? The character surprises me and, and along the way. Um, again, um, you know, did I know that Tracy was gonna, gonna move to cold cases? No, I, I really didn't. Um, but it's sort of an inevitable um, place for her to go because because of her background. My the difficulty I have now is I have to make sure that the world I created for her stays relevant because um, readers have really loved Dell and Faz and Kins and and uh, they hate Johnny Nolasco and and all those things. So 
my my job now is to is to make sure that the, that that world stays relevant to to Tracy. Here's uh, maybe a good final question for for both of you. Um, and Jess just came in with it. Um, I think it's a she. Uh, does writing get easier or harder with each new novel? I'll go first, Luann. Um, for me, I think it gets easier. And I say that because what I what I think is happening is that I'm a lot more confident in the in my voice. And um, I think that's something that every writer has to to develop and and and, and accept. You know, stop trying to be the next John Grisham or the next Michael Connelly or the next Stephen King and just be yourself so that when when people pick up your book from page one, they immediately know that this is a Robert Dugoni novel. And I liken it to uh, the show American Idol and almost invariably the singer that wins every year is the one that the the professionals say, if I shut my eyes and I heard your voice, I would know it was you. And I think writers have to do the same thing is they have to, they have to get com com confident enough to allow, to, to be who they are and know that there's an audience out there for, for their voice. What he said, completely. <laughs> I feel the exact same way. Yeah, you just, I think it gets easier. I think you know yourself better. It's not so in your head, it's more just who you are. And uh, the voice is, is yours, so I- Yeah, but you know, it also really helps to have, um, to be in sync with your publisher and with your editor. And, you know, I've been with Bob through at least three publishers. Um, and, you know, it really makes a difference that your confidence in being yourself and your voice grows, I think, when you have a good fit yeah. with the people working on your books. That applies to you too. Yeah. I mean, you have, the, you have the same publisher and the same editor, but um, I, I've talked to many writers who are very uncomfortable with where they are and that affects how they write. So, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's just luck, you know, getting to the right, you know, I often think that, you know, marriage is partly just luck, you know, you found the right person at the right moment in your life. Um, timing has a lot to do with how life goes and we're not in control of that. Yeah, I, do agree with I, I agree with you. I, I think I think you're right, Barb. Is you know you 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 find a place where they they believe in you, and um, they believe in your writing, and it just it sort of frees you up to to be the to be the writer that you know that you are, and not try to be somebody you're not. Anything else, Patrick? Nope, that's about it, really. Any question of your own that you, because generally you are full of questions. Yours um, are all about cats, right? I can see that they're still running up and down. Yeah, the I love the cats. Um, no, it's been a really fascinating conversation. You know, I, I can't think of anything that I, I could ask right now. Um, I know John Charles is kind of ready for me to get his other event started. <laughs> well, that's true. We have a we have a sequential event with an Indonesian author this yeah. evening, a debut author, which is very exciting. And it starts in about five or 10 minutes. So if any of you oh. are looking for further conversation, stick around. Jesse yeah. Sutanto, isn't that her name? That's right. Um, yeah. And uh, she's had a lot of great publicity for this first novel, the name of which is escaping me, but it's like A is for Antis, is that right? Dial, dial, a, is, dial a for Antis. Yep. Right. So that'd be fun. Anyway, what a pleasure. Luann, I'll look forward to seeing you in June with Paul Doyron. I'm excited about that. And Bob, I'm glad we've kept our records straight here. Yes. And, yes. You know, and, and I'm thrilled to know that we have five more encounters coming up. Well, I'm, I'm hoping September will be the, the book and that'll be The World Played Chess. It's the second literary novel. And I'm hoping that'll be when I can I can actually come down and in person and, and see you all. So well, we've Fingers all been crossed. vaccinated, the whole staff, I have um, to. my whole family yeah. too. So we'll see. I um, I have just flown um, for the first time since COVID started, um, you know, all the way up to New York and home. And um, it's a little scary when you it haven't is. traveled for a long time. You yeah. know, it's kind of uncomfortable going through the airport and security. Yeah. And um, we all have to get used to things again, but I don't, we don't, don't want to stay in our houses forever. No. So. 
I oh. certainly hope that, you know, you'll get a chance to come and that Luann will get a chance to come and I'll we'll come all carry on. Patrick, I'll, I'll see you Thursday. I'll be home That's then. Good. And uh, thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Good night. Thanks, Barb. Thanks, thanks, Patrick. You bet. Thanks, Patrick. Good night, everybody. Good night.